uh, to give me a sign that he has uh, started recording. Uh, oh, it has already been started. So, um, okay. So, welcome to the ELD MOOC. Welcome to this afternoon session on how to value ecosystem services. I'm very happy to have Hannes Etter today from the ELD initiative who will uh, introduce us uh, to three examples of um, valuation methods. I am uh, your host for today and the online tutor for the entire course. I am Claudia Musekamp and I will be guiding you through this afternoon meeting. Um, I've met many of you already online and uh, I'll be glad to answer questions regarding the course later in our question section or any other time uh, in, uh, during the course and many of you have already taken the chance uh, to do so. Um, we'll have a presentation of about 30 minutes from Hannes and uh, We'll then have the uh, questions section uh, where you uh, may open your uh, microphone and we'll call on you. I'll explain how that is done. Um, we'll call on you uh, to answer your questions, uh, to take your questions, and Hannes Etta will be glad uh, to answer those. Um, um, as an online tutor, I have to say I was uh, very impressed by the quality of the uh, submissions we got uh, from uh, you from uh, for the assignment to uh, in which you have described ecosystem services. I have to say great work and uh, really great work and we could uh, see how much effort and uh, thoughts have uh, gone into that and uh, we are very happy with uh, that and uh, would like to thank you uh, for all your um, engagement uh, for this class. Um, we will get back to you with a feedback. It will take a moment because uh, the 45 submissions are, are about uh, together, put together, are uh, more than 100 pages long, so it takes a moment to read uh, all those and give a feedback to you. Um, before I introduce today's speaker to you, I would uh, like to ask about uh, the experience uh, you have with um, evaluation methods uh, so far. Um, I am wondering um, if you were to describe your level of knowledge in the valuation methods, what would you say? Would you say they are totally new to me, as they were to me, uh, or have you heard of them before? Um, have you studied them before, maybe in your economics uh, class? Or have you even had a chance to use them in your work, apply them to a case in your um, practice? So I see votes coming in. I see also more people having joined us. Please take the chance to um, answer this question. I see uh, more people have joined. Abdul, Aldo Cruz, welcome to the meeting. Florian, Gernot, Hans, welcome. Holger, uh, Louis Philippe, welcome to this meeting. Martin, René. So, so many more have joined and please take the chance um, to reply to this question um, and give us a chance to find out what is the level of knowledge in this uh, class. Corey joining from the Philippines. Welcome, Gernot. Hello. So, okay. Um, 
from what I see, uh, we have um, a strong group, one third of our group who says, well, it's totally new to me. Uh, I, the, the evaluation method that we'll learn more about uh, today, um, half a group had heard about them, half of our group had heard about uh, the methods and uh, didn't but didn't have a chance to study them about one tenth had a chance to study evaluation methods and a small group even had uh, a chance to use them in um, their work uh, so there is uh, some uh, senior uh, knowledge in this uh, class where uh, many others are still uh, happy to learn more about uh, the methods. Um, okay, that's a in very interesting uh, feedback from this uh, group today. And uh, now I would like uh, to hand over to Hannes Etter. Welcome, Hannes. Thank you, Vladia. Hannes is the scientific uh, coordinator of the ELD initiative in Bonn and um, he will uh, introduce us to three selected valuation methods and uh, tell us about uh, three cases in which these methods have been used. Uh, Hannes Etter is now with the ELD initiative. He used to work with uh, the United Nations University uh, on a project on West Africa. He holds a, a diploma in geography and has worked in a um, project in Southern Africa and uh, Southeast Asia, Asia. So welcome with me, Hannes Etter, to this afternoon session, and I'll be glad to hand over to you, Hannes. Okay, thanks, Claudia. I will just try to figure out how to get to my presentation, actually, which is here, I hope, everybody can see now. Yeah, okay. So, Yes, today um, I'm really glad to have so many people of you showing up for today's session, uh, which is focusing on the economist toolbox, as this nice little, nice little says. Uh, we'll look into different valuation methods um, due to the fact that it's the core business of the ELD initiative, which is focusing on the economic benefits. And of course, we need to identify how to assess these economic benefits on the economic value of ecosystem services. So. Um, what is the plan for today? Um, we will look into, first of all, frame the whole concept of economic valuation through the total economic value framework. Um, and from there on quickly, I'd like to jump into the three different case studies which I have prepared or which I have looked up. Um, the first one is looking into non-demand based methods, which will be explained later on. Um, it's a case um, from Namibia, which I have researched myself. Um, from there on, we jump a bit more northwards to Kenya, where uh, we will look into the travel cost method, which was based on a, um, which was, yeah, looking onto the value of flamingos and more specifically of flamingo watching. And the third one, which we will be looking into, is the benefit transfer method, and thereby focusing on Europe, more specifically um, the Catalan coast and Spain. So, um, and of course, the recommended conclusions and what to do with those um, yeah, evaluation techniques, which I might have preferred, are being included as well. So, um, the total economic framework, what exactly is it? Um, as we would like, or the ELD initiative likes to evaluate ecosystems and uh, produce services, um, we have framed our approach with the total economic value of uh, framework or, and we would like to assess the total economic value of um, ecosystem service. And since we're looking on land degradation, we mostly focus on land and also land-based services. Um, so the total economic value frames and looks into what are the specific ecosystem services in a specific ecosystem and divides them between um, ecosystem services which produce use values and 
because of some services which produce non-use values. And so the use value is actually the, um, it's the value of ecosystem services which can be utilized directly by the use in the ecosystem. Um, in contrast to that, the non-use values are more um, not directly applicable or not directly utilizable um, and a bit more abstract. Thereby, I'd like to focus this presentation on the use values. Um, it's a bit small, but I guess you all can see um, three different types of use values are existent. For one side, we have the use values which are um, the ecosystem services which can be used directly, such as wood, prov wood provision or um, the production of, um, yeah, say, charcoal from an ecosystem. That's all what you can directly utilize. In contrast to that, you have the indirect um, use values, which are more the underlying uh, ecosystem services. Think about uh, CO2 sequestration, think about um, water purification, all that are indirect use values, which are still important. Um, the third option which we have there is also the option value. Um, the option value, you can also relate to insurances. So you have um, the, you have the um, possibility of switching your ecosystem, of switching to another ecosystem services, which you can utilize and substitute a certain uh, service which can also be of a value for you as it provides security. Um, the question is now on how we can actually capture these values which are in, a, in these ecosystem services. And um, especially focusing on use values, we have um, two specific approaches. We have the non-demand based methods and we have the revealed preference method. Um, well, the first ones, the non-demand uh, method, non-demand based methods are um, uh, Valuation methods, which are not really um, based on a create, concrete demand survey, but they use surrogate information sources to relate specific ecosystem services, such as mentioned in wood provisioning services, to um, yeah to a specific value, which um, can be either gained from a market, a surrogate market, or maybe can be gained um, from looking into other issues. And what I would like to focus on here is also the re replacement method. Um, in contrast to that, we have the reveal preference method, which is actually demand-based, as it looks into how specific users in an ecosystem demand. Okay, uh, how specific um, ecosystem service users demand specific services, and um, more how uh, which preferences they actually have. Um, Okay, so now um, in this framework here, we have two different methods. We have the hedonic pricing method and we have the travel cost method. The latter I will focus on in the next in a case study specifically. And um, the third, uh, the third option or the third methodology which um, I have right now prepared is a benefit transfer method, which is not really valuing um, ecosystem services themselves, but looking into analysis which are um, being done previously and try to transfer the information on the benefits of ecosystem services to, um, to a specific case. So this was more or less um, the, the general overview about the whole concept. Um, let me quickly jump to the next slide and it gets confusing, sorry. Okay, and give you an overview about the um, first examples which I prepared focusing on non-depend based methods. Um, the case study, which we will look on later on, has, be, has been using the market price approach and also the replacement cost um, method. Um, so the market price um, method is looking on, um, it estimates the economic value of an ecosystem, um, which is bought and sold in specific markets. Um, I've mentioned the timber production before, so you can see a, a forest, for example, has uh, provides timber as an ecosystem services which is then being, then being sold in specific markets. Therefore, you can actually value the timber production function of the forest through um, the market value of wood. And thereby measures, um, this me method actually measures people's willingness to pay for a specific service. Um, this has a clear advantage as, um, as it's relatively easy to apply. Um, since we have market um, information usually av readily available, um, it is well defined and therefore accepted, especially from policy users, as it's clear what um, the yeah what the whole method does. Um, on the other side, we have some sh shortcomings. Um, 
which uh, is, of course, if you have missing or distorted markets, to think about subsidies, which are influencing the market values of um, things which are being sold quite gravely, they can actually um, change the value which comes out of the uh, methodology. Um, sometimes you also have insufficient records. If you think about um, yeah, small markets which do not record their prices, you, you might lack some information about the prices. Um, okay, so second option, which has also been applied in the same case study, which I will present, is the replacement cost method. Um, this methodology measures the costs which are related to replacing a specific ecosystem services which might have been lost. Um, so if you think about the forest, which I just mentioned before, um, it also captures CO2. So it uh, secures CO2 and reduces the CO2 concentration. Um, we, we uh, especially in Europe, we, uh, different approaches have been, or technical approaches have been developed to store CO2 um, in an artificial way, which comes uh, with high costs. Therefore, it relates those high costs which are related to um, developing and establishing technical solutions to store CO2 might be especially related to the value of the forest in this case. Um, of course, our, this method is also quite easy to apply as the values or the, the costs are usually quite known. Um, it captures the use value of a specific ecosystem and is therefore quite straightforward. On the other hand, um, the artificial replacements uh, may not be able to fully compensate for the loss of the original ecosystem services. So if you just um, value the, the mentioned forest by its ability to store CO2, you kind of forget all the other different um, ecosystem services which might be important. So uh, speak of the, about the biodiversity, speak about the timber production, all that. Um, so, so you kind of lack some other information on this. Um, second point is that the fully replacement um, data might not be available as um, some technical solutions are more complicated and you might not be able to get the full range of costs. So how could you actually uh, apply those methods? Um, for this, I would like to, to present to you the showcase of Namibia where um, I've done my research focusing on degradation in of the savanna ecosystem. And the problem in Namibia was there that we have an increased encroachment of the natural savanna system with um, acacia species, which are thorny bushes. Uh, they grow quite dense on the Namibian savanna and um, they reduce the amount of produced ecosystem services um, due to the fact that uh, they prohibit uh, grass cover uh, from growing. So you have reduced grass um, and you also reduce the infiltration capacity of water to groundwater, which is quite severe for a country as Namibia, which is really arid. Um, the, the origin of this problem was that uh, climate change, but mostly mismanagement of the savanna ecosystem has uh, had a grave impact and therefore yeah, triggered the development of thorny bushes in those places. Um, the problem is that local farmers now cannot utilize the savannas to an extent which they would like as for example, those bushes pro, yeah, prohibit um, cows to, to roam around sufficiently to find enough grazing. So it reduces the carrying capacity and also other ecosystem services. Therefore, the objective of the whole approach was um, to create a subsidy scheme, which was funded by the public sector to support farmers to restore the ecosystem services. And in this case, this means cutting down the bushes and apply a sustainable rangeland management system. Um, and there were increasing the land productivity. Um, unfortunately, cutting down bushes is quite expensive as those things are quite thorny and it's not really nice to cut them down. So it makes the whole opportunity cost of this quite high. Um, the, the approach which we chose there was um, to calculate the economic benefits which uh, arrive at the governmental side. So see how much increased uh, gains the, the governmental sector has which can then be utilized to subsidy um, the farmers who apply a sustainable rangeland management and restore the natural savanna. Um, this was calculated um, over a period of 10 years to, to justify a long-term subsidy level and also to, to um, so, yeah, secure um, a long-term and sustainable rangeland management. So what, what ecosystem services have then been evaluated and how? Um, yes. So 
we I have um, consulted in Namibia with different stakeholders who have been um, yeah present there, and they uh, clearly pointed out the three main important ecosystem services, which was on first hand the livestock production. Um, on the second hand, it was the water provisioning service from the savanna ecosystem and also the, the energy production. Um, from there on, I chose what kind of um, method would be appropriate to value those services. Uh, for the livestock production, I chose the market price. Um, the reason for that was that it was quite easy and straightforward to do. So what I did was um, I looked into the different carrying capacities of livestock um, of the savanna ecosystem services in areas where you have land degradation, so where you have bushes, and where there's no land degradation, and compared the different carrying capacities uh, of those uh, related areas. By calculating how much kilograms of meat each um, specific area can produce, either degraded or not degraded, you can see how much benefits or how much tax benefit actually can arise per hectare, um, which is related by, um, by the meat price. So an area which is generally less degraded can produce more meat, which increases the income for the farmer and which thereby also increases the income for the government by taxes. Um, the, the second um, ecosystem services was uh, the water provision. Um, which is quite important, as I mentioned before, Namibia has, uh, is a severely dry country and lacks a lot of water resources. So the problem was that those bushes, as already mentioned, they change the soil characteristics and prohibit water from trickling down into the ground groundwater, thereby reducing available water resources. Um, as a consequence, N the Namibian Water Provisioning Service, which is also funded by the government, has to increase its technical infrastructure to um, maintain the same water yields at the water abstraction points. So um, due to the reduced level of um, water infiltration, the infrastructure costs increased as they, as they had to increase uh, the pump capacity and all that. Thereby, um, by cutting down bushes and thereby increasing the groundwater infiltration rates, you could actually yeah, avoid those increased ground, uh, this increased infrastructure extension and thereby save money, which is being, which is benefiting the public sector again. The third um, provisioning service was the energy production um, and thereby also used the market price, where I looked at the utilization of the um, cut down bush material um, to produce electricity, which can thereby benefit the, uh, again, public um, electricity provider in Namibia. Um, so by, by increasing, by cutting down those bushes, you, sorry, you um, get, get electricity power, which you can also sell to, to users and also benefit, um, which also benefits the public sector again. So as a result, after compiling the different, um, yeah, after collecting those different values of the ecosystem services and especially the restored services, um, it was identified that in general, overall, um, about, after a period of 10 years, um, the, this, the public funding scheme could contribute about 42% um, of the required clearing cost per hectare to the farmers. That means a substantial reduction of the yeah, needed cost or the, the rising costs for farmers to restore the land and thereby a high incentive to farmers. Um, this can also then be especially differentiated by applying this to in a GIS system and calculating the um, yeah the area relevant increased benefits, which I did on this map. But overall, you can say if you combine all those different benefits per, per hectare, you can reduce the cost per for, for each farmer about forty two percent, which is quite a good and uh, feasible thing to do. And thereby, the Namibian government, in together with GIZ, has now started a debushing project, which is actually doing and implementing the um, partly the suggested approach, which I have researched there. So that was a non-device method from Namibia. So let me quickly jump a bit more northwards to Kenya, where um, I've uh, looked up a case study which is focusing on the demand-based methods. Um, so I, I've chosen the travel cost methodology as it, is quite, um, as it provides quite a clear picture of um, what's, what demand-based methods do. Um, the travel cost methodology uh, relates recreational services of an ecosystem um, to the accepted travel cost by visitors. 
So simply speaking, you can say um, if a visitor, if somebody would like to go to a lake and go fishing there, um, he's willing to accept a specific distance until he says uh, the lake is too far away, it's too expensive to go there. And um, thereby you can produce a demand function where you can relate the um, yeah, accepted traveling cost to the distance and to the other costs which occur of going to a recreational site. Um, therefore, the traveling time and the transportation costs represent a site's access costs. If you now, if you then look on the on the behavior, and thereby on the revealed preferences of the different users, you can relate the um, preferences um, of the different users to a site. Um, the travel costs actually has two different approaches there. You can easily cal uh, calculate the zonal travel cost or the individual travel cost. Um, the zonal traveling cost relates or creates um, different zones around a recreational site. For example, right here we have a, a circular a zonal tool where in the center you have the recreational sites, be it, a, be it a wooden forest where you would like to go for a hike. And by uh, drawing different zones with homogeneous uh, characteristics, you can actually say that each zone gradually increases the traveling cost and thereby each, from each zone the users have different different uh, valuation of the service site. And in contrast to that, the individual traveling cost approach is more or less based on the individual characteristics and relates factors as um, income and also education, all that to the demand function and sees how those individual characteristics might increase or decrease the willingness to pay or willingness to accept cost to travel to a different uh, place. Um, so the advantages of the whole approach is that it's quite easy to apply, especially the zonal traveling approach. And um, as it is done in uh, surveys, you have the quite a good possibility to increase um, your sample size and have a wide uh, cover of different people. Um, unfortunately, this can only be uh, the, the application of the travel cost method is limited to cultural ecosystem services as it only looks into the recreational value. And also you have different methodological, method, methodological limitations. Um, such as um, substituting sites might complicate the whole method. But for more information, I refer you greatly to our um, outlining curriculum. So let us quickly jump into the case study itself. Um, the, the point which has been um, uh, assessed in the, in the Kenya case was the flamingos values. You have a, a, a national park in Kenya called the Lake Nakuru National Park where um, flamingo a lot of flamingos are available and people are readily go there to, to have a look on those flamingos. And um, the approach was to estimate the recreational value of actually going to the to, to visit those flamingos and um, preserving those flamingo populations there. Um, the, the approach which was chosen was throughput. So on the one side, we have a zonal travel cost for non-residents, meaning it was assessed how non-residents, people from abroad were coming there and on the other side, you have the individual travel cost for residents, looking on how people who are living in Kenya actually look onto the whole process. Um, and the travel costs on both sides are used as a proxy for recreation activity value. Um, so um, it was uh, it was agreed to to um, see the zone to uh, apply the zone travel cost for non-resident users. Um, see the so you were looking at um, um, the values of the flight cost um, from each assigned zone. So you would say a, a person coming from Germany to Kenya is a willing to accept a specific amount of cost to fly to Kenya, while a person who is more living close by, say example for, from Ethiopia, is, willing, uh, is paying much less to get to Kenya. Thereby the whole trip cost for the people um, coming from Kenya are much lower which relate back to the time they spent in the national park to look at the flamingos. And thereby you can relate the, the general overall trip cost to the time they spent in the park. Um, for the residents, another approach was chosen. They were looking at the individual traveling cost. So they see what kind of individual characteristic influenced the decision and preferences of the people going to the national park and looking at the flamingos. Mm, the uh, different uh, variables they included in the demand function were focusing on um, the income, looking at the age and education, but also mostly focusing on the traveling cost um, to substitute sites. 
um, the results they get from their nasal were were quite um, interesting. So they um, so they, they just found that the economic potential of the Lake Nakuru National Park was greatly um, underutilized, meaning that people would be willing to accept much higher, um, much higher, uh, yeah, entrance fees, especially the ones coming from abroad, as they were willing to bear more cost um, than actually being paid right now. So there was a greater potential to increase the fees and the, especially the entrance fees, um, and there were raising more funds. For, for preserving the Philomena population. So um, after the study was published, uh, it was quite, it was well uptaken by the people managing the parks, and they saw that um, it was possible to increase the entrance fee for non-residents by 310%, meaning great substantial fee, but they still, the people from the board were willing to pay those fees. Um, and by that, they raised a lot of funds and were able to preserve the environmental quality, which was um, the, the yeah, the most influential point for the visitors um, to value the point, the, the site in Namibia. Um, so that was the example from Kenya. Both of um, Hannes, before you head on to the next slide, there was a question uh, yes. regarding the first case on uh, the wood and uh, energy and comparing uh, to cost of electricity. So you may mm -hmm. want to uh, take that up before you head on to the third uh, slide. Yes, sure. um, okay, so the question was exactly, um, it was, yeah, if, um, if I mean the converting the wood to energy in terms of comparing it to the cost of electricity. Um, it was more or less both. So I was looking into convert um, the potential of converting the wood to energy, which is producing electricity. And uh, as a substitute value for that, I was looking into the cost of the, the, the benefits and the price of electricity. So you save per kilogram of wood you cut down and convert into electricity, you get a certain amount of uh, power from it. And then you relate the price, price for this power to the cut down and to the cut down wood. Does that make it more clear? <laughs> I guess so. Okay, good. Um, then from there on, let me quickly jump to the benefit transfer methodology. Um, so the benefit transfer methodology is not a valuation or an empirical valuation method itself, but more it uses economic information, which was um, obtained from previously undertaken case studies and value transfers um, to, to make inferences about the economic value of ecosystem services at the specific site you're looking. So for example, if you look and if you're focusing on one watershed in Italy and you would like to see the, the price of uh, the value of water purification in that specific watershed in Italy, um, the, the benefit transfer method would look into other case studies which exist all around the globe and see about the value of water purification in other related uh, watersheds and then transfer those values, uh, apply and um, modify it accordingly to the local circumstances and then assign the, the average value to the specific watershed you're looking at too. Um, so to do so, um, a four step approach is wise. So first of all, of course, you identify the, your scope, see where, where and what you're looking into, which ecosystem and which ecosystem services. And then um, you start to identify existing case studies which exactly look on this issue. Um, so you pile up a great amount of literature on this specific topic. Um, the second step would be then to assess the transferability um, of the, of the pilot of literature you have. So you look into the similarity of ecosystem services, the um, different cases you pilot up or you put into your database, um, how, how the uh, stakeholders uh, are distributed. So you also have um, a similar set of stakeholders there and the institutional frameworks should be at least a bit um, similar so that it is able, to, so that you are able to relate the different institutional frameworks which are underlying the specific cases. Um, after um, selecting then the relevant um, and transferable case studies from your uh, database, you should start to screen and select the case studies based on their quality. Of course, with a decreasing amount um, of quality in the yeah, relating or comparable case studies, you also start 
to um, to to lose um, credibility. So you should see that you mostly look into peer-reviewed case studies, which are focusing on similar ecosystems. And then, as a fourth step, you also have to adjust to local circumstances. So if you compare an uh, an ecosystem which is based in a um, in a European context with where the wages, for example, are quite high, um, it is kind of um, you, you cannot transfer the, the values directly from a context where, for example, wages are lower because um, the, the local circumstances are quite important and influential on the um, current value system, which is in place and the point you're looking to. Um, uh, the advantage of the whole uh, benefit transfer method is that it's quite easy to conceptualize and um, due to the fact that it does not involve empirical um, work in the first place, it's quite well uh, suited as a first screening option. So you can do, do a desktop study and look into literature and transfer those insights based in, from your office and you know, do not need the time intensive and uh, finance intensive process of doing actual research on the ground. Um, unfortunately, by doing so, you heavily rely on the quality of the studies you're looking into and you're comparing the, the whole thing to, um, as I mentioned before. Uh, also, the adjustment of um, the, the different case studies to your local site increases the error margin or the risk of um, accurately wrongly calculate. Yes. Um, <clears throat> um, on the Catalan coast, which is based on the Mediterranean Sea, um, it was look um, the the case study looked into a rationale to strengthen the coastal management strategy and especially raise more funds and justify funding on the coastal management activities as for example the uh, infrastructure development water purification and other efforts which are necessary to secure the coastal ecosystem are quite costly so he, it, uh, the objective was to find monetary arguments to support um, the coastal management strategy and to support coastal management um, activities and sustain the uh, coast. Um, the approach was generally to uh, uh, conduct a spatial value transfer, which means that you actually um, look into a spatial category, a uh, spatial land cover and spatial marine cover um, on a specific administrative unit and then transfer the values based on this land cover to those areas. Um, it was then, um, so this was mostly done through a GIS thing, uh, GIS, sorry, I'm kind of struggling with the presentation here. Yes. Okay, this was mostly done um, with a GIS approach. So you uh, by a geographical information system, uh, which is uh, conceptualizing maps, you would first of all develop or assess the, um, the, the available land cover classes. So you would see, okay, um, based on this, based on this satellite imagery, you find different land and marine cover classes which are producing specific ecosystem services. For example, if you look onto um, a geographical image, you might, you might be able to identify the grassland ecosystem, which you can then relate to the information you obtain from the literature and see what kind of ecosystem services you can get out from the grassland uh, ecosystem. Um, these land cover classes and also marine cover classes were then um, linked to those ecosystem services and uh, then valued later on. Um, so the table in the, on this slide here gives you a good idea, if you can read it, about the assessed um, land cover classes. For example, here on the, on the marine ecosystem, you have the shell cover. Um, you also have uh, the beach ecosystem. Uh, on the terrestrial ecosystem, you have a, uh, on the terrestrial domain, you have the grassland ecosystem and also cropland ecosystem. Each of these different ecosystems has then have then been reviewed in the literature or based on the literature, and um, a specific value per hectare was identified. As uh, you could calculate how many hectares of um, the the target areas are covered by the specific ecosystem, for example, grassland, you can then see what the produced ecosystem value is. Um, as a result, you could say uh, the, the whole ecosystem services which were produced in the area constitute about 2.8% of the stu study GDP, which amounts to a quite substantial amount of money. In this point, 3.2 million US dollars, per, um, which was produced on nearly 1 million hectares. So you could say the coastal the coastal area on the Catalan coast, or the, 
um, produce a quite a substantial amount of money, which is a clear justification to further finance sustainable land use, man uh, sustainable management, and um, to sustain the, the ecosystem service flow. Um, the, the other advantage of utilizing GIS and utilizing a spatial approach is that you can clearly identify which regions produce the most ecosystem services. For example, on this map, which has been produced in the case study, you can clearly point out that here in the south, where, which is called in a region which is called Ebro uh, River Delta, uh, and clearly pointed out by high by a light green color, you can um, see that um, a lot of uh, a high amount of value is being produced by this ecosystem, which increases the reason, the rationality to invest um, into yeah, maintaining the ecosystems, especially in this area. So it gives the the uh, local government a good uh, argumental, argumentative base to maintain and invest into these ecosystems, um, which is also which was the objective of the study and therefore uh, uh, achieved. So what does that tell us in conclusion? Um, you, yeah, it was kind of clear that evaluation of an ecosystem services um, should be on a ba based on a case-by-case -case basis, meaning that you should not apply blueprint approaches and um, jump into a, a the whole approach by a step-by-step -step approach, but you should see that each time you try to do an ecosystem service evaluation, um, focusing on the economic value, you should look into the specific case and see, uh, yeah, pay attention to the specific circumstances which are there. Um, also due to the fact that a wide, wide range of different methods is available, um, researchers must be really careful to which method they actually select as each method has its advantages and disadvantages and therefore is also geared to certain ecosystem services um, they, should, they are aiming for in their evaluation. Um, so my suggestions for you, if you would start to, to do your own uh, assessment would be, first of all, to see what exactly is the objective of your research. Are you trying to um, capture generally the value of an ecosystem for purely academic uh, interest? Or are you actually trying to justify a funding scheme, for example, as was the case in Namibia? Or um, are you aiming for preservation activities and you want to raise funds for this? Um, after clearing that, um, do you have to think about what are the main ecosystem services that are present in this specific area, uh, prioritize those and see what kind of ecosystems do you need to value in your specific case study? The more ecosystem services you actually try to assess, the more intense and complicated your work might be. So you, the more selective you are, the more specific you can be. Um, as a sec next step would be to, to see about um, the resources you have available. Um, of course, the more complicated your assessment gets, um, the more time and the more um, money, uh, uh, financial intensive the whole research becomes. So. My suggestion here would be to say, if you have a constrained budget or you have a constrained time frame, you have to see on how and what, what can be done and what should better not be done or what can be substituted by less resource intensive approaches. Mm. And after you clear that, you should see what, what kind of data is available. Um, if you're looking into cases where a lot of data is available, it might be feasible to apply the benefit transfer approach. If you're looking into um, cases where less data is available, it might be necessary to conduct empirical research by yourself and assess the value by, by it. Um, so see what kind of data is available and what other data would you require to conduct your assessment. And um, although the whole process of ecosystem service evaluation might look kind of scary in the beginning and there's a lot of work, I'd rather go for the quote of Mark Twain which says it's wiser to find out than to suppose. So I would welcome and embrace you all to, to go and find out what your actually ecosystems you have um, outlined in your, um, in your assignments already, which are quite nice. Um, what, are, what are they worth and what is their value? And do not suppose and assess what, what other people think. So by that, I would really close. I would like to close the whole presentation, hand over to you and all your questions, and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Hannes, for this uh, great introduction to valuation methods. Uh, that it has been very interesting to me to see how different valuation methods are used 
for different landscapes for different uh, cases. And for all of you, you will have the opportunity to uh, use those valuation methods later in the course. We'll have a, a, a case study um, uh, in starting in week five. After this uh, week, we, you, we, you will have uh, the opportunity to um, use the valuation uh, method for a specific uh, scenario. Uh, but before we open to uh, the general audience, I would like to uh, take up the uh, three questions that were um, asked in the uh, chat. And I'm going to read those. Uh, this is the Namibia Acacia example uh, and the replacement costs. Uh, the question was, you removed brush to support farming, but how did you assure yourselves of long-term protect, protection of the ecosystem? Uh, what were the long-term risks of removing this flora? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the third question is also related uh, to uh, the acacia bushes in the first example. Uh, and uh, the electricity uh, production. I think uh, you have elaborated on that, but uh, please go back to the Namibia example. And then we have uh, the question number two on the oh, no, uh, regression functions used in the different methods. But please take up the um, Questions on Namibia and then um, the second one, please. I have mute my microphone so you, they, all of you hear better. Um, yes, of course. I mean, the, the, looking at the long-term perspective and look, also looking on the sustainability of um, actually yeah, modifying the ecosystem again is quite important. Um, in the case of Namibia, um, the original, yeah, configuration of the ecosystem was um, the savanna ecosystem, which is characterized by grassland, uh, by grass vegetation. So by cutting down the bushes, actually, you would return usually to the original state, which was beforehand modified by human interfering by um, putting on too many cows or too much cattle. Overgrazing also leads or directly to bush encroachment, especially in the Namibian context. Thereby, after cutting down bushes, which is the first step to restoration, also the sustainable land use management um, has to be applied, meaning that carrying capacities need to be uh, respected and also be maintained. Um, of course, that is a really constraint of the whole approach that um, after cutting down, the farmer has to, has to be forced or has to, it has to be secure that the farmer does not overutilize the, the ecosystem again, leading to the same degradation experience before. Um, I just had, um, through after my evaluation, I just had a brief period of looking into this, but um, it was um, the the uh, government of Namibia has been looking more into this issue as well, which is more looking into the social process. But sure, um, I have to say, in my assessment itself, that was insufficiently covered. But I was my objective here was to look into economic uh, dimension of the whole process. It's sad, happily replying your questions. Okay, why don't you take on the one on uh, regression functions? Um, for the regression function, um, I would like to invite you to look in the um, publication themselves. I actually have them. Um, Claudia, can I shift the presentation again? Yes. yes actually, it works. Good. Um, so, yes, okay, here I have uh, the citation for the specific case studies themselves. Um, I think if, if we start to go into the whole economic details here, we might blow the, the range or the, the setting of the whole book session here, right here. I would like to invite you to copy those informations as well. I might be able to provide you with the PDF otherwise directly. And if you're really interested in the regression function, look at the publications. Sorry. Uh, 
Okay, thanks. Um, I think that uh, holds true for uh, the questions raised in the chat that couldn't be answered. We'll uh, uh, take a copy of all the chat questions and we'll be uh, glad to answer those in the um, um, MOOC forum. Uh, so if the question couldn't be uh, taken today, like the one I think from uh, Radhika uh, about contingency valuation method, can we take that question or can we uh, we we reply to that in the uh, forum? Yes. And th there was also a question of. Uh, how to evaluate potential ecosystem services if the land hasn't been utilized. Uh, so example of a desert being made for fertile, so that's kind of not uh, degrading land, but upgrading land, I would say. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you, if you start to uh, uptake use, you also have opportunity cost, meaning you have to invest into specific activities which are costing. So on the long term, it, you should make sure that the activities you're um, aiming for, for example, greening a desert, is economically sustainable. So if you, if you have to invest more than you can get out of the whole ecosystem uh, on the sustainable use on the long term, it might be not too wise to engage in this activity. Okay. Okay. Um, Hannes, could you again uh, pick up uh, question number three? I think that's a detail that uh, uh, many of our participants today would like uh, to learn more about. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the bushes and electricity, electricity production. Sure. Um, so with the, the acacia bushes, there are a lot of different uh, methods being developed or to, to actually convert uh, thorny or wood to energy. Um, in the case of Namibia, um, two approaches have been crystallized out as the most feasible ones. The first one was um, to cut down the bushes, uh, yeah, cut them into really small pieces and pressure them into wood bricks which are actually um, being sold out under, under, an ecological, under an ecologic brand and being shipped to North America and also Europe, I think, for people um, set up barbecuing. Um, another approach there was uh, to, to, and this was the one which I used in my model, um, to, to cut it down and bring it to local combustion places where they burn it um, and transfer it and, and change the, the, the uh, energy storage. If you want to, I can provide you with a more technical paper on this. Um, there, are, there are plenty of other options to, to convert those uh, calcium things. Uh, also, oil is another option to, to convert, to extract the oil from those. Um, but I'm not too sure actually on what kind of aspect now you're going for, the more technical or economical dimension of this. I think we can take that question and uh, get more discussion going on in the uh, MOOC forum. Uh, before I hand over uh, the microphone to any of you who volunteers, I would like uh, Hannes to give a short answer to that future question number four. What is your experience the future of these methods look like? Well, um... A lot of methods from which, uh, for example, the travel cost methods, they are, I would not say quite old, but they have um, a, a large or a wide and long history of, um, um, of application. And I think they ha are developed quite um, carefully and um, they have proven to work. Of course, each method has its shortfalls and the, um, the increasing tendency, which I see right now, is that um, multi methodology, multi methods approaches are being established um, increasingly, just which secure that the insight from one methodology actually are being secured and validated through another methodology. But um, yeah, I think the, the, the total economic value framework actually is a good frame to cover all the different methods. Okay, thank you. So now we'll open the mic uh, uh, microphone to anyone 
volunteering, uh, you have the chance to raise your hand. So you, uh, you do that by clicking on that little hand button in the upper left corner of your screen. There is that raise your hand sign. And I see already the first uh, raised hand by Andrew. Um, we, you may um, volunteer to um, ask a question, so raise your hand. And uh, if you raise your hand, we can hand over the microphone to you. Uh, you then will hand over the microphone, but you will still have to activate your micro. Uh, you do that by clicking on that uh, little uh, red microphone button that appears um, and then you will uh, be able to um, to speak. And uh, I'm glad to uh, take the first question from uh, Corey. So I'll hand over um, um, the microphone you if you click on that microphone um on that little red microphone button next to your name left to your name um oh sorry um i think it's andrew first so um go uh, go ahead if whoever has the microphone i think andrew uh, chilombo has the microphone first so go ahead please I can't hear anything yet. Um, uh, it may take a second till the connection works. I'm calling on Andrew Chilombo. So please, uh, I see your microphone is on, but I can't hear you. Uh, can't hear you, Andrew. I see that you're replying in the chat. Um, your microphone is on, so okay, we'll take uh, the next question from Corey. You may want to put your question in the chat as well. Uh, Corey, please um, unmute your microphone. Yes. Okay, Corey from the um, Philippines, please. Uh, okay, let me reply. Uh, uh, yeah. um, repeat the question. Here was a question on uh, the Nam Namibia case on how uh, the 300% increase in access costs to um, the the park or the, the area was uh, gained. How, how did you come up with the 310%, please? Mm -hmm. Yes, so the Kenyan case. Um, the the 310% were explicitly focusing on the non-residents as um, the, the behavior of the residents, so the people actually coming from Kenya, was more sensitive um, to, to price changes. So it was found out that if you increase the entrance fee for people coming from Kenya, they would uh, starting to refrain from actually traveling there. Um, it, in contrast to that, um, it was found that people who come from abroad, especially from Europe, um, and uh, were willing to accept higher flying flying prices and the whole general traveling cost for them are much greater. The the part that or the the uh, relative amount of the the entrance fee is not too large for them. So actually, they are willing to accept higher. To accept a higher entrance fee as their general traveling costs are also higher. Therefore, the amount, the relative amount of the entrance fee is not as high as for people coming from Kenya. And how did you come up or how did the Kenya government come up to 300 percent? That was the um, willingness to pay which was assessed in the by the travel cost methods themselves. Oh, so okay. uh, actually, they were looking onto how much pe how much are the people willing to pay for their flights to Kenya, how much time they are in Kenya of their whole time in Kenya they spent in the park, 
and how much time of being in a park they spent on looking at the flamingos. And by relating the time they spent um, in, on looking on the flamingos related to the general flight cost and the traveling cost they spent, you can say each minute on looking on a flamingo is, uh, is being valued by a specific amount of, uh, of money. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's take the next question. I'm glad uh, to call on Radhika from uh, India, a case of Catalan Coast, the Spain uh, example, number three, with benefit transfer. And the question was whether the size of the, uh, the scale of the watershed has to be the same uh, in, uh, when using the benefit transfer method. Please. Um, yeah, so it might be more important to actually look onto the beneficiaries. So see who is benefiting in which way from the services which the watershed themselves um, provide. So the size of the watershed themselves might be not as relevant as um, the characteristics of the people which benefit from that. So there you should look for um, possibilities or not. So if you, for example, look on the water purification service, um, the value that people with low income um, or like global global compared low income um, give to this water purification service cannot be um, in, in absolute terms be as high as the benefits that people with higher incomes can provide. So you, you have to clear out um, or calculate out the, the factor of the income differences, which might be related to the actual value that people in the watersheds apply to the purification service. Okay, thank you. Um, so that's the method is actually about really about transferring the benefits or looking at the benefits to people. Have we got more questions, more volunteers to uh, raise the questions for speaker Hannes Etter? I'd be glad to take more questions. Uh, if you come up with more questions later on, uh, please put them in the MOOC forum. Uh, Hannes and his colleagues will be happy to answer them. Um, if we don't have any more volunteers now, um, okay, there's one more from Cory. Mm, please. Unmute your microphone. No, that's okay. If we don't have more questions, we'll be online for a couple of more minutes. There is one. Mm, no, um, you can ask them a, a little bit later or in the forum, and Hannes Etta will be glad uh, to answer those. Uh, let me. Uh, say thank you to Hannes Etter for this uh, excellent presentation on valuation methods um, that really made uh, the, the clear in um, how uh, the methods uh, can be used. Um, I would like to also um, tell you who's, uh, who the speaker next week, week will be. Uh, we are very happy uh, that next week Professor Dr. Hans Hurni of the Center for Development and Environment from the University of Bern in Switzerland will be presenting and uh, he will talk about how to do a cost-benefit analysis and he will um, tell us more about a case study that he is conducting with uh, 14 colleagues in Ethiopia, a cost-benefit um, analysis on land use in uh, Africa. So we are already looking forward to having uh, Hans Huni 
uh, aboard next week. So thanks again, uh, Hannes. Thanks to the GIZ team who is working sort of behind the curtains to make this possible. Thanks to Emma who has been answering all the questions in the chat and giving a lot of input um, during our uh, um, session. Um, we'll closing now, but before we'll close, we'll come to the fun part. And I would ask Volker to um, make possible that all of you can now start their webcam and 